Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Jonna Talone Sullivan, and I am your host today at Totus Tutus Evangelization Network. And we're very happy that you are here today uh, with us. We have a wonderful guest again, Ted Flint, who many of you um, know of his great works on Garam Mandal. And um, before we start talking uh, to Ted and and our prayer, just a little overview that uh, to set the tone for this interview, uh, we believe that recently uh, there's been really a heightened interest in Garen Bindal. And it is because there is a unique worldwide convergence of religious, geopolitical, and spiritual events that have been happening around the world that have been making many of the prophecies seem to be coming true. So today, it seems like uh, there's a strangulation in our Christianity taking place in the world. And we see that there are changes in the, in this, in the way of the societies and um, civilizations, uh, how they're being governed. And we wonder who these new governing powers uh, will be. Currently, uh, we have Marxism all around us. We see the woke movement. We see Antifa, Black Lives Matter, whole socialists and Marxist movements, and communism is on the brink. So if, if this does happen, people will no longer have their rights, liberties will be stripped from them, and we already see some global implica implications. We have the uh, central bank digital currency is in the works for America. It's already in operation now in China. And the buying and selling for citizens would be impossible unless it would be done digitally underneath governmental central bank control. So we are on the precip precipice of destruction on a global basis. And Ted Flynn, he's the author of uh, Thunder of Justice, The Warning, The Miracle, The Chastisement, The Error, The Peace. This whole soul of his book is about Garen Bindal. But he is here once again, and we're honored to really receive him to listen to his words of wisdom. Uh, it really, um, and we do want to uh, direct you to his website, sign.org. Uh, Ted is about to talk about the divine reset as opposed to this great reset. Now, we know there are many themes and apparition sites that kind of amplify one another. We know there, there are avenues and uh, of uh, we pray the rosary, we have sacraments, reconciliation, conversion, the Eucharist, angels, and all of our hearts are to be reconciled with the love of the hearts of Jesus and Mary. So uh, this is what pretty much the Marian apparitions themes are. And Ted, he wrote a book. Hi, Ted. I'm going to give you the show in a minute. Oh, no, I keep going. I don't, need to, I don't need to talk. You're doing it. You're, you're summing it up. <laughs> I just want to give you a great um, introduction. But uh, so Ted did a 78. Well, he's done many, many things. He he He's traveled over 50 countries in the world. He's done over 300 radio and TV publishing um, uh, on po TV shows on politics and religion and the culture. He's quite a dynamic man for every one of us who are privileged to, to know him and his wife. Um, so he did, he did a 78 page pocket booklet that kind of explains the significance of the apparitions of Garamandal from 1961 through 1965. And that was in 2022, last year, he wrote The Garen Bindal and Its Secrets. He's he's wrote a ton of other books that I could list, but for this purpose of this conversation and podcast, uh, I want to greet you, Ted, and thank you so much for uh, coming on board here and to enlighten us further as how you see uh, the direction of our world going. So uh, he spent like 40 years uh, um, investigating Garen Bindal. So today we're going to focus on Ted's great years of works on Garen Bindal. So Ted, why don't we just start with Hail Mary, if we could, and then we will start with our questions. Sure. Go okay. ahead. Yeah. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. Full of grace. The Lord, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. 
Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. So, Ted, let's start. Tell us um, how the Garam and Dahl will be the, the divine reset, uh, not the great reset um, designed by man. Well, that's a very global question. So we'll start from the macro, maybe this show, and go to the micro. So we'll start with the big. My belief, you know, you talk about how I've been interested in it. Uh, I was introduced to Garabandal literally in 1984 through a friend that I met at church. And that morphed into a much deeper relationship. And it was that person's father-in-law who was very involved with Joey Lomangino. And so he had a very, very, very ill daughter. And, you know, he was he was a fund manager who ultimately ended up helping Joey sell his trash recycling business in New York City. And so I learned about it from there. And you mentioned, you know, I've been interested in it for 40 years. That's true. But, you know, I haven't I've only been there twice. I went once in 1994. My wife and I led a pilgrimage there. Um, and that was that's where we saw it first after reading about it and the simplicity of it. And then in uh, 2017, we made a trip also there, which was the 100th anniversary of Fatima. We went in July and I intentionally didn't want to be in Fatima on the 13th of any of those months for the for the anniversary year. So we, we literally, you know, we did, you know, uh, Fatima, Nazare, Santiago, Santander, Garabandal, Lords, And then seeing it again in 2017, we were all struck. We had 100 people. We had two busloads. And we were all struck. We had almost the exact same thought. Fatima was the pillar of, of, Apper, of the Blessed Mother's voice to the world for the 20th century. We all felt that. But when we got to Fatima, we, uh, I'm sorry, when we got to Garabandal, we all felt that there was more to what would happen there, to where literally Fatima and Medjugorje and Garabandal are connected. It's just the continuation of her voice. But we, the, for me, if you look at the interconnectivity of the world economy, where you know we're all driving cars that probably have parts made in twenty different countries and assembled in one and sold in another, that you know the in in geopolitically we know that we're absolutely a mess right now. And literally just two days ago, President Xi of of uh, China and uh, Vladimir Putin of Russia literally are talking about how they're going to lead the new world order. So, you know, for me, Garabandal is the explanation of what heaven will do for the better of humanity. The macro story here is God's love for his people using his blessed mother to be her vo the voice. And it's, and it's always been that. It's just, frankly, that profound and that simple at the same time. She is the, the voice to the world that the, that the Holy Trinity has appointed for this time in history. She's not, she's not rogue. She, she's not a loose cannon on board ship. She has been appointed virtually by the Holy Trinity. So when people can have some sort of negative connotation to what the Blessed Mother's doing, they have to really look at the source of where everything's coming from. Okay, well, we tend to, uh, <clears throat> let's talk more about this. We tend to conjure up uh, different scenarios of what this future may look like. Uh, and you have said that when these events unfold, as heaven has said exactly as prophesied, it may not be exactly as what we think it might be or what we thought it might be. So can you talk more about this? I mean, there seems to be a lot of people for instance, that think that uh, the warning in Garabandal is going to happen in, eight on, in, in the month of April between the 8th through the 16th. And I know we have discussed uh, maybe it uh, could be several months. So if you want to go ahead and um, talk about other speculation dates. 
Well, now you're into a very, very serious subject vis-a-vis -vis specifically Gar Garabandal and then generally other apparitions. And I give, I'm working on something now where I'm giving a lot of space to that very, very, very issue. If a person wants to research Garabandal, they have to go back to what was originally said. We'll hit the April 13th in a minute or the month of April. And but it's all part of the bigger story of what's being said. And you're right, as you said in the introduction, Garabandal is hot now for several reasons. The issue of the prophecy of the Synod, which will hit, as well as the trip to Moscow. But on this issue of, of April, the, the months that were originally given by Conchita on three separate occasions, she said uh, it was March, April, May or June when she spoke on Irish TV as a very young woman. And um, there was actually, there is even a, a, a comment made by the host that her kids were outside and they could hear them. And so, you know, she's not one to have spoken a lot over the years. It's very, very, very infrequent when she'll make some sort of statement. The last one that I can remember, and maybe one wasn't made for 20 years in front of that was during COVID that the Blessed Mother was, was uh, that heaven was slowing the world down to reflect more on spiritual things, which did happen during COVID. But when you go back to the original writings, she said on Irish TV, March, April, May, or June. Another time previously, she said March, April, or May. And another one, she said April, May, or June. So the only two months that are consistent in there is April or May. Now the source, now that's from Conchita. So we have to look at who that's from. And then there is a woman by the name of Maria Sirocco, who is the source of the April date. She's a very, uh, I don't know where she is now. If she's still alive, she's very, very old. And um, she is the source of where it would be in, in the month of April. She's the sole source of that. She's a friend of Garabandal. She would never do anything to hurt it. She was very involved with Mary Lowley and um, knew, knew the families and was a promoter of it, did radio, TV, wrote, et cetera. And so, but she's the source of the April. Now we know that the, as you say, between the 8th and the 16th, that's one of the qualifications of which we can go over later, just right in a row of what was originally said. Uh -huh but it was March, April, May, or June. And then uh, now it's gone down to April. And a lot of people are looking for a Thursday in April It would because it would happen on a Thursday at 8.30 p.m. on the feast of a young Eucharistic martyr. So there is some uh, information where people can come to a conclusion based upon either anecdotal data, which in my opinion is not as good as the original. And, you know, right now, you know, everybody with an internet connection with insomnia is blogging and writing and, and nobody really knows what's true out there and what isn't. Okay. So you, I think a person has to go back to a lot of the original data. And there is nobody as more qualified on earth than, than Barry Hanratty with all of his writings, nearly over 60 years of posting things in, in the Garabandal magazine with Joey Lomangino. And then when Joey died in 2014, uh, he then started the Garabandal journal. So I always look, I have hundreds of those. What is his name? Barry what? Barry Hanratty for me, is the gold standard of, of quoting anything to do with Garabandal. Why? Because when you have a person who has devoted their life to a spiritual cause like this, is devoted to it and would never want to harm it, that person for me is very reliable. Okay. Well, let's do this. Let's, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's, let's just step back now to the beginning of Garabandal. Let's do that. Let's just briefly most people know this story, but let's just briefly uh, tell the story how it began began in June of uh, June eighteenth, nineteen sixty one, uh, and how many appearances did the Blessed Mother have over how many years? Um, and then we'll go into what that first message uh, uh, to the world, uh, did what Our Lady um, revealed. Okay. Right. 
Well, the, the Blessed Mother came to a small village with literally only 80 homes and about 300 people in a very, very simple village with literally a village in northern Spain by the Bay of Biscay, about a 75 minute drive from Santander, which is a fairly large cosmopolitan city in northern Spain. Beautiful, actually. It's very, very pretty. And uh, she came nearly 2000 times. It was actually close to four and a half years from um, June of 1961 when the events started um, all of the way to November 1965, which was the last message. So that's really about four years and what, four months. So it's even a little bit over four years. So it, when, when, when there is 2000 visitations, that's a very, very significant event. And some things were said there that were virtually monumental for, for things that could happen to the world that could change it forever. Do you remember what, what was the very first message to, uh, for the world that did Our Lady reveal? Let me read that to you. I actually always have that handy. Um, it, it's so prescient, it has to be stated uh, exact. Um, okay. It says, many sacrifices must be made. Much penance must be done. We must pay many visits to the Blessed Sacrament. But first of all, we must be very good. If we do not do this, punishment awaits us. Already the cup is filling up. And if we do not change, we will be punished. Wow. So, so. so th there's a mouthful in there that there, there talks about punishment, the cup is filling up. And I guess since we're hitting the first message right there, we can virtually go, if you want, to the very last message, and we can segue to that, because we'll see the consistency of the first and the last, if you'd like to do that. Uh, we can, and then I'm going to ask you what the um, two main focal points are <clears throat> that Our Lady wanted the world to, to, to know about, well, conversion. Well, the Garabandal, and, and again, where people talk about radical messages, no matter what the apparition site, the Blessed Mother is always pointing to her son. She's virtually always speaking about the most basic fundamentals and rubrics of the faith. She's not out there into very esoteric or ethereal subjects. She's spoke, speaking always about practicality for what we should be doing. And so the, the primary messages were really about the importance of the Eucharist and the priesthood. Whoa. So, I mean, so what's so radical that somebody could, as a Catholic, could have problems with that? So here's what she said in the last one. Since, and you can say where she already, don't forget, the cup is filling. And mm -hmm. if we do not change, we will be punished. Now, remember, these these apparitions were actually almost completely contemporaneous with what was happening in Vatican II. And so she said, since my message of October 18th, 1961 has not been complied with and has not been made known to the world, I will tell you that this is the last one. Before the chalice was filling, now it is overflowing. Many cardinals, many bishops, and many priests are on the path of perdition, and they take many souls with them. To the Eucharist, there is given less and less importance. We should avoid the wrath of God on us by our good efforts. If you ask pardon with a sincere soul, he will pardon you. It is I, your mother, who through the intercession of St. Michael, wish to say that you amend that you are already in the last warnings and that I love you much and do not want your condemnation. Ask us sincerely and we will give to you. You should sacrifice more. Think of the passion of Jesus. And she always came wearing the brown scapular on her arm. That's, wow, that's just pretty much says everything. Um, uh, praying the rosary, the brown scapular, the importance of Eucharist and the priesthood. Let's talk about uh, this Eucharistic martyr. There's speculation on who that might be in those ranges. And you certainly, you know, are very knowledgeable on who one of those martyrs might be. 
Well, um, now we're into, you use the word speculation. This is entirely speculation of who it may be. And as you even said earlier, a lot of times the way we think they'll happen, they won't be. Mm -hmm. But as it was written, it'll happen exactly, but not as we think with our finite mind and with our finite resources and with a, with our finite limited capability to process exactly what heaven's doing. Right. So there, is, there are several, this has been a parlor game as well as guessing the day of the miracle, quite frankly, of who the saint could be, the young Eucharistic martyr of the Eucharist, which, you know, an event will take place at that time for the, for the day of the miracle. There's been several, several mentioned in history. One is St. Pancras. If anybody can go back and look at these people on the, on, on the Wikipedia to see who they are. Um, St. Pancras is one. St. Hermenengeld, many people feel could be one. St. Stanislas, I've heard the name. And, and, uh, another one is um, uh, the one who, who seems to have a lot of people thinking is St. Tarsitius. He was a young boy of about 13 years old who lived in the time of Emperor Valerian in Rome, who was a tremendous persecutor in the first century uh, of these young, uh, this young faith called Christianity in Rome that was causing a stir where there was tremendous persecution. And there were several people who were going to be killed the next day whether it was in, in Circus Maximus or whatever, I don't know. But they were supposed to be killed the next day and they wanted to receive communion. They wanted to receive the Eucharist. So uh, they didn't know who to send. So a, a young boy of 13 volunteered and one of the early bishops didn't want to send him to, do, to uh, send the Eucharist, literally a consecrated Eucharist, to um, the prison and the young boy said, that's exactly all why I should go. Nobody would suspect me. And so uh, the bishop did let him go. Uh, some people on his way to the prison saw him coveting something on his chest in, in some sort of container, uh, the ancient pics of its day. And uh, they saw that he wouldn't give it up. And so they killed him to take it. So he's one that is thought of as a very possible day. Uh, and then you go back and look at their feast days and everything else. Is it March, April, May, or June? So people try to piece this together, and I understand that. But there's one that stands out for me more than any other one that's totally consistent with the messages of Garabandal. And her name is Amelda Lambertini. She lived in the 14th century it's alleged she died in the in May 13th, uh, 1333. And she was a young girl who wanted to receive the Eucharist, but as 12, as uh, I guess she was 12 years old, and, and the bishop said her priest said she was too young to receive the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And so she was unable to receive it. And mind you, this is the 14th century. And so uh, she was in the church when people with first communions were being made and literally uh, a host flew on her tongue and she received communion. Now that's exactly what happened to Conchita Gonzalez as a very young girl to where the archangel gave her communion, which there's pictures all over. Anybody who has studied Garabandal knows the pictures of Conchita receiving the Eucharist. And it was said that, you know, only a priest could do it. And um, uh, the, the, it, it was the Blessed Mother said that the Eucharist came from a consecrated host that was actually in the church, in the tabernacle. So, you know, th that conforms the way Imelda Lambertini, who is the patron saint of First Communicants. Is she a martyr? Uh, she, uh, well, well, I'm glad you asked that. The, the, the second part of that, I was going to forget that. The second part is as soon as she received the Eucharist, she died in joy. Oh, wow. And so she, now we have the stigmata. We have by location. The Catholic Church has some tremendous preternatural, supernatural gifts of, of, of extreme mysticism. And so what happened with Imelda 
she died exactly like Father Louis Andreu, the Jesuit priest, after he literally saw the miracle at Garabandal. He had been there. He uh, was a Jesuit from Northern Spain, went to the apparitions uh, and saw many of them. And then he was granted the grace to see the great miracle. And he was in a car on the way down the mountain. And he said, milagro, milagro, milagro. And he died of ecstasy. Mm -hmm. And he had, he had just said, today is the happiest day of my life. Oh, my goodness. So there's Imelda Lambertini. So now this is a consistent. And heaven has, <laughs> heaven has an order. Heaven heaven knows knows math heaven knows everything to do with the order of how the world works mm -hmm. so that would be one for me that would make an awful lot of sense that but if, if we want to talk about speculation that's my guess mm -hmm. is no better than frankly anybody else's but that was may 13th because she was born on may 13th or died on may 13th yeah. yeah yeah okay so it could be april may like you said and that's why, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's speculation. Uh, I, Got it. Yeah, I don't guess. I'm, I'm very, very cautious about that. I present data in everything that I've ever done, and then people can make their own decisions. Got it. Well, let's let, tell us, you know, there's many contemporary uh, saints of our time uh, that really believed in Conchita. And if you want to talk about that, it would be great. Um well, I think that has weight. We, we, uh, anybody, you know, I'm going to assume the people have marginal knowledge about Garabandal and some have more. So maybe okay. we'll do a little bit more, maybe for the sake of just being more complete for those that don't have it. Sure, but go ahead. Padre Pio was a very, very uh, open defender of Garabandal who believed in it. And there was a young man from New York City who had gone to Garabandal to see Padre Pio at San Giovanni Rotundo by the name of Joey Lomangino, who he ultimately founded the Garabandal magazine with Barry Hanratty, you know, like in the very, very early 1970s. And he said to um, uh, Padre Pio, should I go to Garab should I go to Garabandal? And, Ga and, and Padre Pio said in confession, why not? And so Joey said, is it real? He said, yes. So the stories about Padre Pio with even Conchita, where they had met, and um, uh, Padre Pio, when he died, asked that uh, Conchita would be given, you know, the head covering that a, that a lot of people wear, and I think maybe Italian right. and others. It's like the equivalent of like a mantilla or something, a little head covering. Uh, Padre Pio asked that that be given to Conchita when he died. Oh, wow. And did and he, he kiss Conchita's hand and her crucifix? He, he did. He did. Uh, and, and he was a big defender of it. Another person who was a big believer in it was uh, Mother Teresa, who was actually godmother to one or more of Conchita's children. She is a was was openly... Uh, a defender of it. Uh, John Paul II, we know, d defended it and actually wrote an inscription in a book that uh, 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 an Austrian man by the name of Albrecht Weber uh, wrote called Garabandal, The Finger of God. And it was sent to John Paul II and, it, and Cardinal Jeevish handled the correspondence of it. And John Paul II wrote a little inscription to continue to promote the messages of Garabandal in the front of his book okay. and sent it back to him. And so um, we know Father Walter Chiswick, who spent 15 years in the very famous Lubyanka prison, who, uh, and then a total of 23 years in Soviet captivity, isolation, and prison systems in the Gulag. When he, when he was released from prison after being accused of being a Vatican spy inside the Soviet Union, as he was delivering, as a Jesuit was delivering the sacraments to the, to the people after the Bolshevik revolution, he was thrown in jail. And so when he came, when he was released after a total of 23 years, he lived around the Fordham area 
and at Fordham, became familiar with Garabandal and was a deep believer in it. And so um, Mother Angelica, one of the more uh, of the last ones, she had Joey Lomangino on her her EWTN, and it was the actually the most popular program in the history of EWTN while she was alive. Now, Mother Angelica's name was Rita Rizzo before she was a nun, and she was very much introduced to mysticism in Canton, Ohio, by a woman by the name of Rhoda Wise, anybody who knows her. So she became very, very open to the mystical young through a grace. And when Mother Angelica had a very, very bad accident with one of those floor cleaners that flipped around, those big ones flipped around and hit her hip, she ended up wearing braces for decades and she, she had a healing and of every single place in the world that Mother Angelica could have gone, she went to Garabandal to give thanks. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And so, you know, she, she you know, uh, she here, so here, Rita Rizzo had uh, an Italian man by the name of Joey Lomangino on. And it was very, very obvious. Uh, and it could even be on YouTube because a lot of the VHS tapes were made of this stuff. And um, she um, literally, as I say, went to Garabandal to give thanks. Wow. I had Mother Angelica as a guest in our home for uh, two nights and three days in the year 2000, where she was a speaker at one of our events at the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. And this now anybody who knows Mother Angelica would believe this story. Of, of, of with her boldness that she always had for the promotion of the gospel. She literally told me she was going to ask Mother Angelic. Uh, um, Mother Angelica said she, she was going to ask Conchita if she would uh, give her a day jump from before she told the rest of the world so she could get her camera crew to Garabandal for, for the filming of the great miracle. <laughs> You know, I mean, so, you know, anybody who ever met her would believe that story mm -hmm. because, you know, the prophecy is, is that Conchita would um, uh, announce is going to announce the miracle eight days in advance to the world. Mm -hmm. So but you got to remember, we're going to have the warning first. You know, so right. So, so, wait. so Mother Angelica wanted a jump of a day to beat the crowds. That that's who she was. <laughs> yes, I I knew her as well. Um, before we talk about the warning uh, miracle and the permanent sign, but can we talk uh, uh, about the preludes to the warning uh, right now? Will communism uh, engulf the earth to a degree that mass will be made impossible? Um, you know, communism, you know, that's a very, very big part of the, of the message. Now, the events of the warning and the miracle are two events, but they're like the same play. They're two acts. Once the warning take place, you know that the miracle is going to take place. Mm -hmm. uh, so in other words, no warning, no miracle. Mm -hmm. But there's several things that are, have been given anecdotally as well as um, coming after the apparitions, Albrecht Weber is one of them. But you know, if you talk about communism, communism is, is, is a very, very deep and loaded subject. It takes a lot to unpack it. But in political philosophy, communism is simply a world without God. Now, I think we're at a state in the world, which is, is, is I call acedia. A-C-E-D-I-A. -E this, is, this is the lack of respect of, for people of, of spiritual things. That's where I think we're at. Now, communism and political philosophy, as I say, is just a world without God. You have communism, fascism, socialism, humanism, secularism, and all kind of other, uh, other isms. And they all mean different things. As I say, you know, communism is socialism in a hurry. You can't get to communism until you have a whole lot of, uh, of events that are socialistic along the way. Um, and, you know, all you've got to do is look at, look at a lot of the governments of the world, and especially right now in the West. The governments of the West don't want God in the culture. They believe even, let's 
bring it now more to just the United States. A lot of the left and progressives, they believe the United States Constitution is a failure. A, a lot of the super progressives believe that it's actually a racist document. They believe that democracy in the, in, in the United States is a failed experiment, and they believe Christianity has failed the world. So they're trying to expunge anything to do with God from our culture. That, for me, in a very simplistic way, is communism. And then you can get into the more violent types of, of fascism, or, or if you want to look at the Soviet Union with the Bolshevik Revolution or the Great March of Mao, um, you know, uh, to, uh, in 1948, where they think 100 million could have been killed under Stalin uh, and Lenin, as many as 50 million could have been killed, including even the 30 or so, 20 or 30, whatever the number is, it differs by scholar of how many were killed in the Ukraine under communism. And at any one time in the Soviet gulag system, there are as many as 2 million people in transport to different camps at the height of, uh, of the oppression in the Soviet Union. Yeah, you talk about all this Antichrist surfacing. We had a lot of little Antichrists uh, throughout history, and you makes you wonder what the Antichrist is going to be doing after you look at the past history of what uh, some of these terrible leaders, uh, so-called leaders did uh, to our world. And, and people thought then it was the end of the, uh, of the world. Um, you well, know, take they... a look, take a look, even, you know, let's say a person, you know, is red in their forties, go 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s. How many people in their seventies or eighties could have ever dreamed years and years ago, pick a year for them in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, how many could have ever dreamed that we would literally be watching the cultural degradation that we have right now to where we can, a Supreme Court nominee, when she was being um, this Katanji Brown, when she was asked by either Senator Rand Paul or, or Senator Cruz, I'm not sure, in the Judiciary Committee, where she was unwilling to define what a woman was. Mm -hmm. And when we're a culture, when we can't even make a distinction between a man and a woman, something is so fundamental as that, that shows just how lost we are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get any more fundamental than that. And what's happened, we've grown used to this now mm -hmm. over the last couple of years. Why? Because it's everyday news. Who could have ever fathomed in a thousand years that mothers and parents would be welcoming drag queens into, into their toddlers' classes and clapping for it? Yeah, this is oh. <clears throat> this is uh, definitely you know this control element that they want us from cradle to grave that we are being pulled into and uh, becoming uh, um, insensitive and different and and uh, not uh, knowing the truth anymore. The confusion of right and wrong and not standing for the truth uh, and just doing nothing. Uh, some people are doing something. So I, you know, I'm, I'm very much a cheerleader for people who are trying to contact their Congress and do whatever they can uh, for this uh, unbelievable um, situation that is uh, affecting us. That's leading really towards, like you said, communism, fascism, and everything of that nature. What did Pope, what did uh, late, the late Pope Benedict the 16th uh, say about what would happen to the church in the future if we continue on this? This is actually a, a very, very important thing to look at. Uh, a father Ratzinger was actually a, um, uh, you know, who became Benedict the 16th. He was a philosophy pre professor at Regensburg University. Then he became a bishop and then a cardinal as a head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, for many years under John Paul II and then ultimately Pope. So as a young philosopher historian, 
I think I, I think it's in the very early 1960s. He gave what I think is is the single best description of what I've ever read of where the church would ultimately end up. For anybody who wants to Google this or go on Wikipedia, they could look at, you know, Benedict XVI, a comma, um, his, his, uh, his uh, or Father Ratzinger, they should maybe say, uh, Father Ratzinger's writing on the future of the church, mm-hmm. that it would become small, it would become insignificant, it would struggle for survival, and there would be just a few of the remnant to keep it going, and it would lose all of the properties that it had accumulated over the centuries. Mm-hmm. We're here. I mean, the, the, uh, it, it, it's open and fair game on anybody to be a believer today. And by and large, if you're a believer in our culture at the uh, at the leadership level, you, you are going to be knocked down pretty hard. So do we have a form of communism? Yes. Is there still freedom of worship in the United States? Yes. Have they basic, has the government over the the last several decades that I would say maybe starting in 1961 and 62 by the order of the Supreme Court taking the Bible out of the classroom and then um, prayer out of the classroom. So, you know, we, we've, we, we in essence have a form of a totalitarianism as we speak. Oh, and sure. it's incremental, it's incremental, but it's building. And there isn't any believer right now that I know of or I read about that doesn't really feel marginalized. Because if you bring up a Christian thought or to to or even a Christian ideal to in many, many social settings, you're going to become marginalized. And that's why so many people uh, are retreating in into their own networks. And, you know, uh, and to add to that, we see this climate legislation as a vehicle to implement implement population and programs, the new social uh, financial instrument to this um, central bank uh, digital currency, which leads to communism and uh, climate control is one of those programs. We see so many things just merging that it to uh, distract us from really where this this truth is. Can you speak, Ted, to the uh, unorthodox situation of Ukraine and Russia? Because then I want to go into Pope Francis at the uh, and trying to you know why uh, what what why uh, it he hasn't met with Vladimir Putin. But let's can we speak to them? Yeah, I love that. P- pretty witty statement there, the unorthodox situation. <laughs> well, let, let's, un- let, let's, let's unpack that and let's try to go all of the way back very, very quickly in like a PowerPoint type thing. Yeah. I mean, the church split a thousand years ago and, you know, even John Paul II said that he would, uh, one of the goal, he had three main goals of his pontificate, but one of them germane to this conversation was that the church would breathe again with two lungs, where the East and the West would unite. (laughs) So that was one of John Paul II's uh, three things he wanted. So then let's go now to the unorthodox, which was pretty witty. And so um, there's been a prophecy of Garabandal that the Pope would visit Moscow before, around the time of the events or after, I'm not 100% sure exactly the way it reads, because to me, the warning and the miracle are really the same event. And we know they're no more than a year. So and in terms of a civilization or something, a year really doesn't matter with the evolution of events. Mm-hmm. And so um, there is a person by who is the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. His name is Patriarch Kirill. Pope Francis met Patriarch Kirill for the first time in Havana, Cuba at a summit. At, it was actually at an airport where they met and they spent some time. So they have known each other. And at the beginning of this war, which what is about 13 months old now in the Ukraine. It started what, February 25th, 2021. So, and here we are in March of 2023. So we're just about now 13 months, give or take a few days. And so um, 
Pope Francis wanted to uh, wants to go to Moscow. He actually wants to go. Let's let's even back up. I'm sorry, I, I jumped one event. Coming home from Cyprus and Greece right. in December of, of, of 2021, he made a uh, 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 coming home on the plane. He said he would like to go to Moscow. So we know there's a prophecy and the Pope actually wants to go, but he's got to be invited by the president of the country. Uh, an archbishop, cardinal bishop doesn't work. They want they want the protection and, and everything else to do with government at the same time. And so could he go? He may not be granted a veto any, anyway. So he wants to be invited by Vladimir Putin. So the Pope on his second time says he'd like to go. And then uh, another time is he literally went to the Russian embassy at the beginning of the war with obviously wanting to intervene as a plea for peace. Now, something happened. Now, what's the date today? Today is March 23rd. Okay, 23rd. So literally 10 days ago, March 13th, there was a public announcement that the uh, Zelensky, uh, as the president of the Ukraine, was closing a, a 980 year old monastery mm. in, in, in the Ukraine. And I'll say it, you know, phonetically in English, the Petrush Lavra, L A V R A, monastery complex. So here is uh, Zelensky closing uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox, which is basically the Russian Orthodox in Ukraine as a Ukrainian church. And they've been there all of these centuries. And he gave them to literally March 29th to vacate the premises. Why? Because he said the Ukraine needs to exert uh, its spiritual independence so what he's doing is he wants anything to do with the Russian Orthodox Church out of his country. So then I went to uh -huh. I went to Wikipedia after that, and I've never done this since the beginning of the war. I've been to Ukraine, I've been to Russia, Belarus, and most of Eastern European countries. And you know, over towards the east in Donetsk, which is Russian, and then you've got the south in Crimea, which is heavily, heavily Russian. Um, there are 44 million people in, in, in Ukraine as of today, as I saw on the net. And about 45% 45 of, 45 of those people identify as Russian. So with the Zelensky now closing the Ukrainian Orthodox churches and the biggest, it's like the Vatican over there. It's, it's there, there, it's like coming in and closing the Vatican for an, uh, for a leader, uh, that's going to create more and more problems and make the situation even more complex because now it's not a geopolitical situation. Now he's Zelensky is actually going after the Russian Orthodox in Ukraine. Wow. So we have if OK, so here we have um, Pope Fran Francis, who's expressed an interest that he'd like to meet with Putin. And then Putin, obviously, it hasn't happened. What? Why can you? Why do you think Putin is trying to avoid such a meeting? Well, it, absolutely great question. I mean, now you're into the nuances of, of is, it, is it related of geo, to this? Of ge geopolitics? Okay, I mean, it's not related to. Oh the, no, no, no! Okay. It, 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 it's very. It's it, it's it's actually a core issue of why it may not happen or okay. happen. Okay. And, and, and it's actually central to the issue. I we see. have a situation where Putin could be embarrassed uh -huh. if, if he invites the Pope and the Pope uh, gives some sort of solution that maybe a lot of people like and maybe even the West likes it. it, it he could be embarrassed by that. So will, will he allow that? No. But also what happened... Um, the West realizes that Patriarch Kirill is a puppet of the Russian government. You don't end up as the head of uh, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church unless the government approves of what you're saying and doing every single day. I see. And what happened uh, about six months ago, six to eight months ago right now, Patriarch Kirill came out more and more and more in favor of what Russia was doing in the Ukraine 
Shazam. I mean, you know, that's that's a very political position. Is there a, a, an ecclesiastical authority in that? Absolutely, yes. As the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, yes. But on the other hand, here's Kirill very much backing what Russia is doing. Hmm. Now, you know, Kiev Rus goes back all of the way to 888. Kiev Rus is, is literally the trade route was from Kiev or Kiev all the way to Russia. I mean, that goes back, uh, you know, more than a thousand years now. So, you know, there's a lot of interrelationships, marriages, same language for, for centuries. So, you know, uh, family ties, ancestral ties. So this is a this is as complex as it gets. Huh. Okay, well, I have a lot of questions here. So I'm going to uh, uh, step into another one about the synod uh, and this uh, synodality that's been uh, prophesied at Garamendal. Um, what did... Um, what 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 was that what what did and what is we know cardinal pell in australia he died he just yeah. died what did he say about the pontificate of of pope francis well it wasn't so much the pontificate uh, i think was he it was moral issues well, no no he was well let's let's go back to the synod synod and then we'll hit that issue okay. because the bigger issue is what the synod all of the way back when in 1966 and 67, when Conchita was actually a student at a school in, in Burgos, she uh, uh, told a nun apparently that the, the events would happen near a synod. Now there have been synods in the history of the church and Vatican II was the last big synod, which was from 1961 to 65, where we got the, the you know the Novus Ordo and the modern church you know because the church of the day had all been the traditional Latin mass and also one of the prophecies of Garabandal is that the mass would be suppressed mm -hmm. the only mass at that time was the was the traditional Latin mass gotcha. so but the synod she said it would take place near a synod now there's several odd things this synod has never been done in the history of the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. There's never been one where a Pope has, has, has commanded all of, the, all of the bishops in the world to have listening sessions, to go out and listen to the people and in, in dialogue on what's going on in the church. That's never happened before. So it makes it a little bit more unique than anything in Catholic history. And so originally it was for two years, it's been pushed out now to uh, closing all of the way in October of 2024. Okay. And somebody told me just the, the other day that I was speaking to from Spain that there, there's talk that he's going to push it out for another year. So, but he, that it could go out all the way to 2025 now for these listening in dialogue sessions with the clergy and the lady. Now, now here we are, you want to talk about how fast things are moving in the church. You know, we just said today's March 13th, 2023. And literally uh, March 10th in Berlin, there was just a, a, a statement issued where all of the Catholic laity and clergy, which is their equivalent of a uh, of, of, of a religious council, they all met and there were 202 of them in 176 with something like 14 in abstentia and, and, and 12 voting against. They voted for this, that woman could preach from the pulpit, that laity could or, or, or laity could preach from the pulpit um, they, they would, their lady could do baptisms, and they were going to bless same-sex unions as officially recognized in the German church. So what do we have there if we take a look at those that voted against it? Only 7% of the entire um, leadership committee or council of all Germany voted against same-sex marriage. Peace. We're, we're um, so are we we're at a trouble? Are, are we at a communist phase? 
Uh, is that communism? It's a form of communism, yes. So that gets back to how broad this term really, really is. So now, now Germany is just one church. I can tell you the Dutch are in the exact same position. Belgium's probably even worse on, is, with the decades of leadership that they had with, with Cardinal Gottfried Donnells. So, you know, a lot of the dissent comes out of Northern Europe. Yeah, and that's why I kind of led into, was thinking on that terms of what Cardinal Pell was talking about, some of the moral issues that are being uh, brought forth uh, to us uh, and how everything is changing and it's changing uh, quickly. What what did, what did Pell call it? Did he call it something like spiritual poison? Yes. Do you remember this phrase? Um, no, I just remember that he mentioned about there are several moral issues that were affected with this current pope and um uh that were uh not that were in controversy to what the normal traditional catholicism uh way of life uh being and i know there's been a lot of talk out there that you know we have to pray for our this pope and there are a lot of things that and one of them has to be with uh you know keeping up with the new times in the in the church uh he's uh more of a socialist type of a uh, um climate that he uh, preaches and wanting to uh, suppress the Latin mass, suppress uh, monasteries and, and uh, solitude prayer and more be out. Like, uh, like you said, the listening, uh, do a new synod, getting all the people in, in churches, parishes to have mm. listening sessions to see what the people want and varying out to a new type of uh, Christianity. This is why I felt like we're being struck. The strangulation of Christianity is what we've known it out outlined after, especially after John Paul II. Uh, well, passed. this is the, the you, you, you alluded, you didn't use the word confluence, but you use a synonym for that earlier. Where look at why is Garabandal make sense to me personally? The confluence of the data geopolitically, economically, uh, in academia, in every single place that we can point to in the church, entertainment, it's lost its way. The religious orders have lost their way. You know, uh, there isn't any group that has probably more lost their way as a group of men than the Jesuits. They have just simply you know, lost their minds in terms of, of their original founding and what they believe probably mm -hmm. as younger men. But um, um, this is why Garabandal makes sense, because it's the only thing that I think this illumination where we'll see the state of our soul um, can, uh, can reverse this tide of grievous, grievous sin, because in the church, We've we've had some nutty popes. We've had some popes way out there, clerics. There's you know it, it's a storied history. In many respects, there's nothing new in that respect. But we have never had the corruption isn't new. But we have never had as a magisterial church uh, going in the direction they're going for same sex marriage on a uh, on a very very broad basis that is that's that's flying right into the face of scriptural integrity which you can have a lot of different social opinions on many many things but you cannot fly into the face of scriptural truth mm -hmm. and so that's why we in essence in many respects have a de facto schism right now with the difference of ideologies because right. we're seeing open dissent, which is really the message of Akita, of cardinal opposing cardinal, bishop against bishop, confrere against confrere. And so we're seeing tremendous division at a hierarchical level that the church has never seen in public. This is new. There may have been many, many uh, disagreements uh, that were even, there was a, 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 an ongoing battle between Cardinal um, Cardinal Bertoni and the Cardinal, I forget his name right now, of, of Austria. Uh, there was some open battle going on and Benedict literally said, end it. So, but now under Francis, this is a whole new world. 
And that's why people are choosing sides right now. Yeah. So, Ted, how how many popes are there supposed to be? Is the Pope Francis the the end times pope? Well, one of the prophecies, and this gets, I, and I get into this in the book. Um, there is, you know, at, at one time, it's a very, very ambiguous way that it's written, the, the way the prophecy was written. And it was from Conchita that there would be three more popes and then El Fin de, Le, de los Tiempos, the end of times, not the end of the world, the end of times. And then there was an, and then it said and one would reign a short time. So and then there is another one that it said there would be four more popes and one would reign a short time. And so mm -hmm. if you take a uh, so they could both be right. Or, you know, in, in that respect. But if you want to take a look at it, there would be four more popes and one would reign a short time. You want to talk about being on your mark. John Paul I pontificate was only 33 days. So from when John Paul, John the 23rd opened up this, um, the, the Second Vatican Council and he died in 1962 when Garabandal was going on. So then we had Pope Paul VI, one, uh, John Paul I for 33 days, John Paul II, and then Benedict. So there's your four with one reigning a short time. So, but there is discrepancy, you know, from a, a, a purely a form of scholarship and integrity on, on how that was written and how it was said. And they could both be right three and one plus one would reign a short time or four, including one would reign a short time. So they could both be right, but it's, it, it's, it's caused confusion. And I break down what the original phrase was in the book. Okay. And uh, so let's talk about the warning here for a second. Um, is it, do we assume that there's some sort of a cosmic or heavenly event that in the skies that's going to be seen in a worldwide basis affiliated with the warning as we see, you know, the state of our soul? Um, could be. There's, you know, it, uh, Conchita talked about something like a comet. And if you remember that old book by Yves DuPont, that little lavender color book, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was like a pocket-sized penguin, very, very small, maybe not only 80 or 90 pages. The cover of that book was a comet coming into the world. Mm -hmm. Um, could be, she said it would be something like an A, which nobody has ever figured out what the A is. There's much more data on um, a comet or something because the word was used, but a young girl at 11 or, or 12 years old wouldn't have known what a comet is either. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but what we do know, th there's a lot less known on the warning than the miracle. There's more data points on the miracle than the warning. But what we do know about the warning, it will, it will, it will come and it will affect every single person in the world. Everything will stop. There's actually where the young girls, as well as their little older gave interviews, sometimes they say it will last five minutes, sometimes 10 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes. So let's say that doesn't matter. So is but this the, a purification for to the miracle? Yeah. I mean, is I mean, this a fearful event? The warning will prepare the world for the miracle. It's where we will all see the state of our soul as God will judge it. So we and change the direction of our lives. Every person I've spoken to maybe over the last 35 years, as many as 20 people who have received it because we've written on it now for so long. Uh -huh. I mean, writing started on this nearly 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And our magazine, Signs of the Times, is now going in its 35th year. And we've written on many, many stories of people who have seen the state of their soul. People we've written about Stanley Villa Vincencio. I even put Father Stephen Shire into a film I did in 1995 where he saw the state of his soul uh -huh. uh, and where he was, in essence, literally in, in a he was being uh, helivacked to a hospital. And he heard the nurse say he won't he, he won't make it to the hospital, but he lived. And so where people see the state of their soul, it has different names. 
the illumination of conscience, the warning, the judgment in miniature, or a life review. Mm -hmm. And they all, in essence, mean the same thing to what the Spanish word is, a viso, mm -hmm. where we see what a grace. So we'll go back to, you know, we're into the, to the tactics of what it is. But what heaven's view of this is just an enormous grace to the world. So it's like a cent second Pentecost where heaven's outlines uh, a different language of its master plan of our Lord's divine love and uh, how he opens doors of the hearts of uh, by illumination of conscience. Um, did you want to speak to about how Garam and the Marian movement of priests address that majestic language? Uh, um, heaven's master plan or uh, i actually maybe another time no oh no no i mean you know i don't know how much time we've got uh, how, how long would you like me to spend on that? <laughs> I, <don't remember. laughs> well, I have so many questions where we're almost close to an hour but uh <laughs> you you're uh, hard you know you're hard to let go i mean you once you start talking it's so easy to go into another question in another direction off the what your statement is so I could have a litany of questions and you could be saying something else that I have to, oh, I want to go that way. <laughs> okay, since, since I can take three hours on it, let me try to do it in two minutes. Okay. Okay, I'll do less than two hours on it due to time constraints of what I always call the oh, poverty. Oh, we just have to have you back. <laughs> the poverty of time talking about this. Father Gobi, who I, I make a an effort not to, on, on many, many times not to mix and match these different apparition sites, locutions, or messages from different people. In certain instances, I do, um, because each apparition needs to stand on its own. When, when, it's, when it's judged by the church, it has to stand on its own. Well, they can't say, well, Medjugorje says this, Fatima says this, you know, Bono, Bono Borang, Pont Maine says this, La Salette, so it has to stand on its own. But Father Gobi gives a very clear indication in the Marian movement of priests that literally the warning is the second Pentecost. Okay. Good. Well, wow, that's less than two minutes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> less than two hours. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about the great miracle. Uh, you think that the great miracle will be so extraordinary with millions making a journey to Garambindal. It will be as the miracles of the Hebrews uh, saw leading Egypt after 400 years of captivity. So can you talk about uh, the great miracle and the nine pines uh, in Garambindal? Will Russia be converted, including the whole world? Will, when will it take place? Let's take place let, let me back. let me just go as it was written there and i'll even read these i mean yeah for me uh garabandal explains everything uh, of what it's the grace coming to the world the grace of of sister faustina the divine mercy in my soul god's very dna is mercy and his messenger as appointed by the trinity for our times is his mother very simple no mary no jesus and so let me read to you what uh, what was said about the miracle. And well, these are just bullets and we can go over them quicker. Yeah. And, yeah. and if you want to stop in any one of them, please do. Okay. It was said it will occur on a Thursday evening at 8.30 p.m. Spanish time. It will between the, be between the 8th and the 16th. Uh, of the month of March, April, May, or June, and it's also inclusive of the 8th and the 16th. Um, uh, much of the li literature, as we know, m mentions March, April, May, but Conchita mentioned June, as we said earlier. And it says it will take place within one year. So now there are many prophecies that it's going to take place in a much short, the, the miracle will take place in a much shorter time after the the warning. That's not what Garabandal said, and that's why I stick to my knitting in just this issue. There are many other people who talk about six weeks, three months, six months, Marie Julie Jahaney, a whole bunch of other people point to this, but this is what was said here, and it's going to stand on its own or die by its own on what was said in the original writings of the mystics. Okay. 
and says the miracle will coincide with an important event in the church. Now, the word coincide is the key word. There are a lot of people saying it's going to be the miracle will be at the day of an ecclesial event. That's not what was said. It, it was specifically said it will take place at a great event in the church. Now, that could be a positive. That could be a negative. There many people think the church is headed to a schism. And the word and, and uh, the word schism is being bandied about a whole lot more because mm -hmm. I think we have a de facto ideological schism right now in the church with the way people are gravitating to orthodoxy or to more progressive overtones. And that's to put that very, very diplomatically. Okay. So the word the miracle will coincide with an important event in the church, positive or negative. We don't know. It will be on the feast of a young Eucharistic martyr of the Eucharist. It, now here, the original, it will last about 15 minutes, but yet it came out later, 5, 10, 15, 20, uh, whatever. It will be seen in the sky. It will be possible to photograph and televise this event, but not touch it. All those in the village or the surrounding mountains will see it. Now, anybody who's been to Garabandal literally knows it's a natural amphitheater. Millions and millions could literally be at Garabandal on the mountains and looking down on the pines. It, 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 it's the Cantabrian Mountains. It's not a little foothill. It's the Cantabrian Mountains where millions could sit there watching it. But on the other hand, Seraphim, who was Conchita's brother who died several years ago, and my guess was quite a bit older than her. He told me in his own home in October of 1994, that at the time of the miracle, it would be very difficult to get to Garabandal. Yeah. So take your pick, war, famine, disease, uh, virus, planes problem pick take your pick whatever it could be but the fact is he said at the time of the miracle it would be very difficult to get there and that needs to be paid attention to uh the sick who are present will all be cured whoa the sick will all be cured okay you've got a you, you've got a very very sick child near death would you go? You have a sick loved one. You have a sick friend, a sick colleague. Would you bring them there if they were open, if you showed them this? They're dying. Would they go? The answer is yes. Many people, as you know, take flights to Lord when they're very, very desperate for a healing because all that have taken place there. And when you see Lords, all you see in the ceilings and the walls are crutches that have been left there. It will be the, the, the operative word here is the, it will be the greatest miracle ever performed by Jesus for the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you want to talk about the, the, the show going on? I'm not missing it. It will be the greatest miracle ever performed by Jesus for the world. Sinners and non-believers will be converted. The incredulous will believe. Russia will be converted after the miracle. And then it says... Uh, all will love our hearts. It doesn't say China. It doesn't say the Persian Gulf. It doesn't say Islam. It, it doesn't say the Korean Peninsula. It says Russia will be converted. In the same way, Russia was the hermeneutical essence of the entire message of Fatima. This is the same thing here. Russia will be converted. Conchita, who knows the date of the miracle, will announce it to the world eight days in advance. So she knows the date, but not the year. She knows she may know the year, but it says she it doesn't say again. Yeah. This is the extrapolation that she said the date. I mean, God say. tells us we never know one day. Or That's day. right. That's right. So I just go on the data and it's the okay. real, I try to stay to it. I mean, it's a great question. But does she know the year of it? Possibly there was a running joke between Mary Lowley and Conchita. Conchita only knew the year of the warning. And if they ever asked Mary Lowley, because we literally more, my wife and I were in Mary Lowley's home once. And she would always say, if people always asked about the miracle, she'd say, go ask, go ask Conchita. And if anybody ever asked Conchita about the year uh, uh, of, of the warning, she'd say, go ask Lowley. <laughs> 
So in other words, but this is what's happened over time. People, people extrapolate and anecdotal stories get big. And then all of a sudden a minnow becomes a very, very large fish. I don't know if you ever know the story of where if, and this happens around all apparition sites with no exception whatsoever, none of with people extrapo extrapolating their own personal data with their own personal views. Mm -hmm. That if, if a, you're at a dinner with 12 people and you tell a person a story at, at six o'clock at night, and then the next person tells it. And by the time the 12th person has heard the story, it's unrecognizable from the original version. Right. And that's what's happened with all of the apparition sites. And it's what's happening also with Garabandal as more and more people get interested in. Okay. But, Continue. But said, a, a, a bishop of Santander will come along who will not believe at first, but will receive a sign and allow priests to go to Garabandal for the miracle. Wow. Okay. Now, um, there has been, uh, there's been many bishops now since 1961 in Garabandal. No bishop, not a single bishop has ever condemned it. It's never been condemned. There's three phases in the church. One is general acceptance like Fatima. They leave it alone in condemnation. It has never been condemned. And this, this is a very, very positive thing. So th they're wise in letting it play out. I think it's very, very foolish for the church to condemn something before they very thoroughly investigate it. It's, there's not a lot of uh, scholarship and integrity if, if they just condemn it without a great deal of, of research and work and sending teams of people to it. But, and then the last one here is before the miracle, many will stop believing in Garabandal. I have often thought that that could be Joey uh, dying in 2014. He literally died on the 53rd anniversary, June 18th, 2014, of the origin of, of the apparitions. Uh, he died literally on its anniversary day of its origin. And with him dying, I think a lot of people have fallen away from Garabandal. But on the other hand, I wonder if it could be one of these other prophecies. Uh, and I'm talking to a lot of people right now that are very, very committed to Garabandal. And I personally wonder if it could be this, this Moscow thing, and then it maybe doesn't happen immediately. It could be, I'm not saying it is or it isn't. The answer is maybe, because the only source of the Moscow um, prophecy was was Albrecht Weber and he didn't write about the he they, he said he heard about it at, at the kitchen table at Conchita's home in 1965 but he didn't write about it till 1993 why <laughs> why did he wait <laughs> did heaven want it that way but this you know as I say you know brain surgery is sometimes easier than a lot of this stuff <laughs> <laughs> wow well, okay. Now, a chastisement said to be contingent upon the world's response to the warning and the great miracle. And uh, the girls were shown this impending chastisement that, as people know, as the night of the screams. And Mary Lowley gave a descriptive, descriptive account of what would come directly from God. And uh, you you seem to know about how, uh, about how Mary Lowley described that. Can you tell us? Um, it, it was horrific. I mean, it, it was a blood curdling scream. So, you know, picture, uh, 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 you know, the, the three of them were 11 and one was 12. And hearing these, you know, it, mind you, a, a simple a village, and you have to get back to the person who is receiving this and their reaction. At the time of that, the apparitions began in Garabandal, there wasn't a moving there wasn't a motor with moving parts. There were virtually only 80 families, about 300 people, very, very, very tiny. And I guess the word could be primitive. You know, cows would be walking through the center of the street. They would, they would get their hay with scythes from the mountaintop. Uh, everything, you know, is very, very, very simple. So the night of screams, is where it is alleged they saw the, the, the chastisement coming to the world with like fire falling on them. Mm. 
Wow. Which is in essence is a message of Akita where fire will fall from heaven. The most severe message in the history of the church that has ever been given is the message of Akita, that the living will envy the dead and fire will fall from heaven, 1973. And I guess the heat and the thirst and the desperation for water? Yeah, that there were there could be a war uh, over just the basic things in life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so, you know, and even when Conchita had heard the word uh, abortion, she couldn't understand how a mother now 12 years, 12 or 13, depending on what year was exactly given. She didn't understand how a mother could even kill her child. So we have to put these things into the culture, their age. Uh, the way the church reacted, it's always a much, much bigger picture of how these things. So could it be more frightening for a little child, the equivalent of seeing a horror movie than mm -hmm. an adult who is much more seasoned and hardened in life than what a young child would see? But they didn't understand what they saw. They didn't understand communism, what that could even be. And they didn't understand how a mother could kill her child. So mind you, you know, we, we didn't get Roe versus Wade until 1973 in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is 12 years later. Yeah. So, um, all right, well, let's do, let's do the last. Um, uh, so we um, can focus on the permanent sign. I wanted to get the permanent sign uh, in with the discussion here. Uh, can you tell us about the permanent sign? Ted, as that's my last question for you. Let's say, you know, um, it'll be there for it. It'll be a permanent sign means that it's going to be permanent. We don't know what it is. Everybody knows, you know, get back to piecing things together, which I call anecdotal information after original. We know at Medjugorje, many things were, were given there and there's much more data with secrets that have been, have they been released? We know that when uh, the, uh, Fatima, nothing was released, but then uh, what the third secret of Fatima really was, but a lot of it ended up leaking out. Mm -hmm. And even Cardinal uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, when head of the CDF, when he was to, who had read the third secret of Fatima and knew the message of Akita Japan, literally said they are in essence the same thing. Okay. They are in essence the same. He used the Latin phrase. They are in essence the same. So, but in, in, uh, a lot of other sites, there's speculation that there will be other sites to re, uh, receive a permanent sign, Medjugorje being one. Mm -hmm. Now, something that happened actually at, at Garabandal uh, for, for several days was a bush was burning, but was never consumed. Hmm. I, find that, I find that fascinating. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, that's what Moses saw on Mount Sinai. Right. And the Hebrew. To, to right. And my thought was, you know, Hebrews followed Moses and there was a cloud by day and fire by night. And, and Right. Uh, I mean, the, in Hebrew, the term would be the Shekinah glory and more phonetically in English, the Shekinah glory, where, you know, the pillar uh, by day and, and, and a fire by night that mm -hmm. followed them for 40 years. It was in, and then how often had quail ever fallen from the sky mm -hmm. that they ate? You know, so what the permanent sign is, is not known, but that could be considered act three. But the, it would be a permanent sign. And it would be forever is the phrase para siempre. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess that's a good place to stop. I I, uh, I I didn't say 40 days, did I? I hope I didn't say that I meant 40 years. But, um, um, you know, uh, you're just always a joy to have and talk to have on the show and always be able to talk to you. You're very um, approachable and you're so knowledgeable and we're gifted by heaven. And uh, it's just a privilege, privilege and honor to really know you and be your friend ted um <clears throat> you know heaven will not abandon his children god loves us and heaven has a plan and we have to um just remember that with everything that's happening we have to be spiritually prepared and seek refuge within the immaculate heart of mary 
and know that um, uh, God is so good that he allows these events only because he desires our love for him and for us to do reparation to his most glorious face. And uh, to, he wants us to be with him forever, for all eternity. So any that's last why, comments? That's why it's the ultimate act of mercy. Heaven is pouring out its grace. There's a verse in scripture where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. This is, this is why I'm calling it now the divine reset. That's what this is. Garabandal is the divine reset. It's, it's God's love is so great for humanity. It's going to meet evil and, and defeat it. That's beautiful. And it's exciting times. So everyone stay strong, stay close to the Lord, to the sacraments, to your prayers, uh, the rosary uh, and reconciliation and confession. Just remember that we're together, all of us, close or far, our spirit and our hearts abound in love together. So thank you, Ted. Uh, you know I'm going to have you back. <laughs> Anytime. I, I love talking about this stuff. I could talk I could talk for a very long time about it. I yeah, love it. Yeah, you're As I say, it, it, keeps me, it keeps me out of the bars. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Give love to your family, and uh, we'll see you again. Until then, thank you, everyone, for joining us here at Totus Tuus Evangelization Network. And until next time, may God bless you. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you.